Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 36th meeting in 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, remind everyone present in, uh, uh, around this table or in the uh, gallery to switch off your phones or at least put them on silent. They can interfere with the broadcast system. Uh, committee members use tablets for this meeting purpose. That's because the papers are provided in digital format. And uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. And uh, that means that we're looking to consider item four, the evidence heard uh, about uh, the, the SRUC uh, from agenda item three in private afterwards. Are we agreed to do that? Thank you very much. Agenda item two today is subordinate legislation and it concerns the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund Grants Scotland Regulation 2015, SSI 2015-359. I refer members to the paper and ask if there are any questions that uh, the members wish to ask or comments to make. Uh, yes, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm, I'm simply would like it put on the record that I'm very pleased to see that this fund is um, being rationalised and it, it will support um, our, our coastal communities, often very fragile, um, through the future, both on uh, onshore and uh, and the fishing industry itself, if it's needed in any transition process. Thank you. I'd like to put on record that there could be a lot more of it if. Uh Scotland's interests had been taken care of by the UK government and uh, that our fishing communi communities, which catch more than 70% of the catch in Britain, uh, are able to be supported better. That would be even uh, to the benefit of uh, many of these communities that Claudia Beamish has just said. But uh, are there any other comments? If not, um, has the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Agenda item three um, this morning, Scotland's Rural uh, University College. Uh, and this business is to take evidence from the chair and the executive management team of the SRUC, Scotland's Rural College. And I welcome uh, the chair, Patrick Macri, uh, the acting chief executive, Janet Swadling, Jeff Sim, the Vice Principal for Research, Alistair Cox, the Interim Head of Professional Services, and uh, Mike Weinberg, uh, Managing Director of SAC Consulting. Welcome to you all. Um, it's a small committee room, so it's very cosy. Um, we wish to uh, begin with questions on a number of areas of your activities, and we're going to start off with the veterinary disease surveillance centres and uh, particularly starting with Inverness. Um, can you give us the latest update please on the plans for the VDSC at Drummond Hill and the veterinary service provision in the Highlands? Thank you, Thank you very much for inviting us to come along to this committee. We very much welcome the opportunity. Um, as you know, the Cabinet Secretary has recently written um, in relation to the work on veterinary disease surveillance. We've been continuing to work very closely with the Scottish Government Independent Strategic Management Board, um, and we are very keen to develop a national strategy with regard to disease surveillance. Um, but I think it's appropriate if I hand over to my colleague, uh, Mike Weinberg, um, to take this matter further. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Convener um, and the committee. Uh, where we've got to uh, now, having gone to a consultation process through the course of uh, the summer, is we've modified our thoughts on where we go from a strategic point of view, and our ambition in Inverness is consistent with some of those updated thoughts. What we'd like to see is that there is uh, a, a widespread Scotland-wide network of uh, facilities where we can gather post-mortem material and uh, specifically in Inverness then what we're looking to do is uh, to move to a facility which would be close to Inverness uh, which would then be able to provide a facility for doing post-mortems to provide an ongoing service uh, to the farming community in that area. Um, what we're currently on with is exploring uh, at least four specific routes which would look at uh, uh, facilities which can be converted to to provide the service that uh, is required 
and that's reached the stage now, of sort of an outline planning stage, really. So <clears throat> that's, that's the point that we're at at the moment. Uh, the intention will be that uh, whenever we get to the point where we have a, a, a facility to move to, that there will be no, no uh, interruption to the service. That will we'll move from one to the other. Right. Um, <clears throat> the follow-on from that is twofold. One, um, is this cost-effective to be moving? Uh, two, uh, are there going to be a similar number of uh, employees in this section and the work that they do in uh, veterinary surveillance? The, um, as far as the cost effectiveness is concerned, yes, with the facility that we're looking at, as I said, we're, we're in the process of working through a number of different options, but uh, we've got clear ideas on where we need to be from a cost point of view, and uh, certainly at this early stage and the ones that we're looking at, it looks as if that is all doable. Um, so that, that'll be the first thing. As far as the uh, people is concerned, I think the, <clears throat> the issue there is that We've got, at the same time as we'll be moving to this new facility to provide a post-mortem uh, operation, what we'd also be doing is moving from the current site across, and sorry, this is not the same time because in the first quarter of next year, we anticipate that the uh, epidemiology research unit would move to the Highlands and Islands uh, new campus. So uh, there'd be a lot of people moving in that direction. Uh, the... Uh, in broad terms, the number will be very similar, although it's likely that uh, some positions would be at risk out of the disease surveillance centre itself, and we'll be exploring routes to uh, redeploy those people uh, amongst our, our operations in that area. What proportion of people are likely to be affected by any such move? Uh, I couldn't give you an exact number, but it would be just over a handful as, of the positions at risk. How many are employed at the moment? On, on the whole site, they'd be in the region of 46 people. But in the uh, PM stuff that you're there going to There we've got 15. So a half of those people. Uh, yes, so, so slightly more than half we've actually managed to place, uh, will automatically fit into our plan, and then there would be a few positions left which we need to think through precisely how we do that, and we've got some options on how to approach okay. that. Okay. Um, uh, Claudia Beamish? Uh, Good morning to you. Could, could I seek reassurance on the marine aspects of the work, um, which I understand is at the moment based um, based at the facility yeah. that we're talking about? But this is obviously very important for the future. So, could, could somebody clarify that for us, please? Absolutely. We've uh, that is integral to the plans that we have. So uh, that that team would continue to operate out of the same facility once we move to that. Thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you very much. Convener, and good morning to you all. Um, just maybe to follow up a little bit on the, the numbers in um, Inverness um, with the new uh, post-mortem facility being created and uh, the other folk moving to the UHI campus and so on, that, that's all fine. And um, it's good to hear about the marine animal stranding. But it sounds as if the capacity of what you're going to be able to do for post-mortems and all that, if you're losing about half the 15 people, your capacity obviously is going to be reduced by maybe a commensurate amount. So what is it that you're doing there just now that you won't be doing in future? I think the, um, uh, just a little bit of history, it is relevant, is that all the disease surveillance centres, all eight of them, was set up and the historic model would have been that all testing of, if I give an example, you would have effectively, a man brings a cow in, uh, the post-mortem would be done by a veterinary surgeon, samples might be collected from that and sent off for various tests. Each one of the surveillance centres would have provided the facility to do a range of tests, microbiology, faecal egg counts, whatever was appropriate for the particular case. Um, the direction of travel now, particularly as testing becomes more sophisticated uh, and uh, the demands from the market become more sophisticated in terms of the requirement for turnaround times, competitiveness in the market, getting your unit price of testing down, and the availability of uh, the equipment for doing that testing is more sophisticated and expensive, is that we will be looking as part of our, our wider strategy at trying to concentrate that sort of testing in uh, one or two facilities. Uh, rather than having each, lab, uh, each lab um, equipped with its own, effectively, a duplication of, of those facilities. So the 
the intention of the wider strategy that we would have is that you'll have these satellite facilities around the country where you can gather the material so the dead cow has got somewhere to go to uh, without having to travel too far a distance. But effectively, once the post-mortem is done and the samples are collected, those are then sent uh, to a centralized laboratory in order to cope with that. And you can then handle it that, that in a way which is really dealing with the most modern technology. Yeah, thank you, convener. Maybe I just come back quickly. I, I can understand the logic of that. Obviously, there's a lot of sense there. So the jobs that will be going um, in Inverness will, in the main, be lab testing jobs and, and maybe some fairly senior people who are doing these tests. Um, and did you give any consideration to the central laboratory facilities being located in the north? I mean. Central facilities doesn't always necessarily have to be mean central belt, you know. So no, no, did you it, consider no, that? It, 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 it certainly doesn't have to just mean central belt, but I think a few things, a few points to make. Uh, firstly, um, I'm not sure that we're saying we're talking about some jobs that are at risk. We're not talking about any that are definitely going, and we are putting considered effort into, into exploring ev the avenue for every particular one. So each one will be looked on its merits, and you know, whether we can redeploy or retrain, that, that comes into the frame. Um, so I think that, that's an important thing. As far as the location of any uh, centralized facility is concerned, uh, the uh, what, what we're looking at is a strategy for the whole of Scotland, not just for the north, although we clearly give uh, significant uh, th thought to where things go specifically in the north. Um, and I think the, the likelihood of concentrating the whole of our operations up there as a centralised laboratory is unlikely. We, would, we have looked at that, we've considered it, um, uh, but what I would say is that uh, there would be a significant implication in terms of moving the current staff that we have from our main laboratory function in Midlothian. So it's, it's unlikely that we would move the whole of them. You know, clearly there are all sorts of implications as far as the number of people is concerned, the costs of moving, the likelihood of their moving and the loss of expertise that would be associated with that. Okay. Um, Mr. Kalina, I wonder if we could just add to that in terms of obviously as Mike has explained about the changing nature of our business, recognising this and recognising the opportunities that the move to the new campus presents. Um, my colleague Jeff ran recently with a number of our team and also with the Highlands and Islands uh, Enterprise Agency, a very significant event looking at new opportunities. And Jeff, do you want to just maybe expand on that? If, if that's I can try and make it uh, pertinent to what we're talking about in terms of the uh, work of uh, PM because the stuff which is going to the Highlands and Islands University we expect to be high standard. We know it's going to be. There isn't any argument with that and we very much welcome it. But the question is in terms of uh, you know, what we're talking about just now. Um, in previous years the Scottish Government has had to allocate additional funding to disease surveillance as the total costs come in over budget. And uh, Will the additional funding still be needed with the new plan and the new site, uh, or will it not? And that's the focus we've got here. Well, I think the, uh, the fact is that uh, if you look back over the past uh, three to four years, the budget, uh, our budget from Scottish Government has actually been cut. So uh, the truth is that the, the, the budget was cut. We've had to deal with a smaller budget. Uh, and that we've been in a position where the uh, uh, funds coming from government through the grant and aid scheme and any uh, contributions from uh, the contingency have not been able to make up uh, our full requirements. So we've been under pressure in the last while and, and in fact the fact that we went to a consultation uh, this year was really brought about by the fact that we were staring uh, a 10% cut effectively where we were told that the contingency funding wasn't going to be provided, we were staring that in the face. So it, it made put some urgency to the situation. As far as whether we will achieve savings with what we're proposing, I have to say that we will still be under significant pressure. It's, it, we will be in a better position than we were, but we will still remain under pressure uh, to be able to do everything that we intend to do because you'll understand that uh, maintaining a presence in Inverness was not our first choice on, on the basis of uh, the numbers, as you like, uh, when we went to a consultation in, in June. Um, so we will continue to be under pressure to look for savings in other parts of the business, and I expect that to continue. 
Uh, Graham Day. Yeah, I think it would be useful to get on the record at this point. Is what we're hearing today a commitment going forward to a, an appropriate footprint in rural settings right across Scotland? Is that what you're committing to today? That is what our ambition is. That's, that our strategy is contrary to what's happened in England, for example, where they've uh, closed a significant number of their disease surveillance centres. Our ambition is to keep a presence around Scotland. And that, that would then mean that the man with the sick cow has somewhere within a, a reasonable distance to take that animal. So as far as the post-mortems, we're splitting that up. We say in the post-mortems, we want to make sure that that's in a locality the farmer can get to. And uh, then the, the lab testing would be moved into a centralised facility over the longer term. So would it be reasonable to expect that the success of committee, committees to this one will not be revisiting this situation in a few years' time? I, I would hope that that is the case, but I think we, we're all conscious that uh, you know, the, the funding that we receive from government is under pressure. And uh, it would be remiss not to say that you know, if, if that funding comes under more pressure, we'll have to consider and adapt. Okay. Okay, well, just thinking about that funding at the moment and the shortfall and so on, um, and the need to cut your cloth, you know, what impact would the uh, shortfall have on uh, veterinary disease surveillance centres in terms of the wider decisions you're making in relation to the disposal of assets and strategic direction. Are you saying that you're having to dispose of assets? Does it mean, for example, that Drummond Hill is part of the uh, assets that you would intend to spend in order to sort of meet the shortfall or to <coughs> meet the costs of change? To our thinking. So it will be contributory to that. It will be contributory to the move to the new campus as well. Funds from there will be required in order to support that move. So, yes, that, that, that is a requirement. Thank you for that. Um, I want to move on to questions about governance more widely. And Jim Hume is going to lead on that just now. Okay, thanks very much, convener. Morning, everybody. Um, yes, the, obviously the, there are some concerns regarding the lack of the alignment between SRUC and Edinburgh University. I think uh, all of us uh, had heard how important that was, and it was actually part of a central plan of the strategic plan 2013 to 2018. I should, I should maybe declare an interest. I am an alumnus of uh, a predecessor to SRUC and uh, do have an interest in a, f in a farming business which does use, use SEC consulting in the borders, just to make that quite clear. Um, obviously, that alignment, after some time, failed to go ahead back in, I think it was June. Uh, we've, uh, the committee wrote to uh, Tim O'Shea, principal of Edinburgh University. He stated uh, to us that after careful consideration at court, it was clear that the level of control over future operations required by the SRUC board was only consistent with the continued operation of SRUC as a wholly autonomous institu institution. And the Edinburgh court papers of May 2015 uh, regarding the alignment state, uh, a detailed risk register is being maintained for the project. The main risks at this stage relate to the participation and commitment of SRUC to the measures required to ensure ongoing financial sustainability, together with the quality and availability of the information needed to support our decision-making processes. So I just wonder, um, what were the governance arrangements the SRUC proposed that led to the failure of the strategic alignment with the University of Edinburgh? I'm very happy to uh, try and take this matter forward. Um, as an institution, we've enjoyed a very strong, close working relationship with the University of Edinburgh for a very long time. And indeed, we entered into the research excellence framework together, um, which proved to be extremely successful. That seemed to then move to a natural progression to explore a strategic alignment, which we were very clear was our preferred plan. Uh, which we worked uh, on for some 15 months in some detail, uh, exchanging um, information in a very um, detailed manner. Um, but from the outset, our board had been very clear that it was important, uh, not least because we'd only just really come together as SIUC, as a, a joined organisation, um, that we wanted to keep the tertiary nature of uh, SIUC. We wanted to keep the integrity of all of the functions, the research, the consultancy, and the full educational ladder. 
um, and that it was appropriate to ensure that there was uh, governance and uh, protection mechanisms really around that. And we had been from the outset uh, <coughs> seeking to ensure that we could have an appropriate board that would be clearly um, reporting to the court of the university, but nevertheless a board which would be able to have representation from the various stakeholders with an interest in SIUC and which would be able to uh, keep that close links with industry. We were also clear that it was important to maintain a commercial board given the importance of our commercial activities as an institution and that those were the key parts of the governance which were clearly required from the outset. Um, as we progressed through the discussions, we certainly saw a significant number of academic benefits, um, but in terms, of, as, as, as we moved to the final stages of discussions, uh, there was, it did not prove possible to reach agreement about those appropriate, appropriate governance arrangements. Okay, so, so just, uh, I'm sure there's other people coming in, but just to clarify, the threat was that you would lose control to Edinburgh University, that they would, they would take up some of, your, um, some, some of your functions that SRUC have, which are quite wide, which we're all aware of, and that they, you yourselves wanted to retain the board and its management structure as it was? No, not seeking to retain the management structure exactly as it was. I think it's important to be very clear that we recognise throughout that the, the Edinburgh Court would be clearly the, um, the, the key body and that the, any board that was established to look after SIUC or whatever it became called would be um, reporting to that main court. But it was nevertheless Im important to ensure that within the governance of the university there would be recognition of the need to ensure that there were protection mechanisms and to protect the longevity of the functions that we cover. Um, that was really to ensure that we were able to continue to deliver for the industry in its widest possible sense. Thanks, sir. Thompson, Thompson. Thompson. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, um, <coughs> I'm just interested, given that finances uh, are a, a real problem for you, um, and um, teasing out one or two things in terms of what might have happened if you'd gone ahead with your merger. I presume um, because of the merger there would have been a big opportunity to reduce the, the governance and your, your overheads in terms of management. And looking at your financial statements, um, I would have to say that um, your senior people and your directors are very well paid indeed. Um, huge amounts of money uh, going to executive directors and uh, others, and even the five of you sitting here, and I don't want to be personal, but probably, and maybe I've got my calculations wrong, at least three quarters of a million a year. So would it have not been financially advantageous for you to go through with the merger and cut these management costs considerably? I think I need to turn to my chairman. Um, thank you for that question. I, I, think, um, I think the reality is that uh, over the piece that we, we, we examine our management costs all the time, and in fact, despite the, uh, the fact that we merged um, with three further colleges, um, we've actually reduced the costs of, of management um, if, if you look at the overall numbers in terms of executive management cost. So I think we've actually done quite well to control the costs and the reality is that we do need leadership within our organisation. And um, that, that leadership uh, has benefited us greatly in terms of what we've been able to deliver, um, both in terms of REF and, and, and other matters. So I think from a board point of view, we're, we're content that the management costs are indeed well controlled. Uh, and if, if you look at them overall, we've actually been able to reduce the management costs and we haven't increased the management um, numbers. Um, so I, I think we've, we've done really quite well. I think if we, if we broaden the discussion uh, with Edinburgh, uh, there is no doubt that it wouldn't have gone ahead without, again, considerable management costs because the individual component parts of SRUC still need to be managed and led. And I, I don't think there was any desire 
uh, if, if you will, um, and, and I can only um, uh, assume this, that, that, that Edinburgh would have been removing um, any of the executive management team from, from, their, from their roles, because I think they saw them fundamental to the, to the progress that the organisation had ma made. Maybe if I could just come back quickly, convener. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that director's remuneration, the, the total figure there is about a million pounds a year. And, uh, you know, we've just been told earlier on that there's going to be potential <coughs> uh, job losses. Maybe they'll be redeployed folk, you know, in, in the Inverness area at a much, much lower level in the organisation. And it just strikes me. Um, not being familiar with the kind of pay levels uh, of organisations like yours, that uh, they're not exactly frugal. I think it's, it's fair to say that the Appointments Remuneration Committee uh, consider our executive salaries, and I think they are in line with what we would expect for an organisation of our scale. I think the other point I would make is that in 2014, I think the total for uh, remuneration was 934,000, but in 2015 it was 735,000. It actually came down uh, in, in 2015. Why did it come down? Because we've reduced the size of the executive management team. Uh, and, and if I may comment in relation to the discussions with Edinburgh, I think um, I can certainly speak personally that it was something which was um, very much that we pursued very, very actively, uh, very much as our preferred plan. And I think as an executive management team, we certainly wish to pursue that um, and did not look at this in terms of at no stage in any discussion was there any suggestion that we needed to continue with an independent organisation for protection of individual yeah. positions. Mike Russell. If I might tackle two questions very briefly, first of which is salaries. You have, I mean, it is on record, and, and, and Janet will know it's on record because she and I know each other in, uh, over a long period of time. I am strongly opposed to the, what I regard as the inflation in salaries in higher education, particularly at the top end of the scale. Uh, you have recently advertised the post of principal and uh, chief executive. What salary are you suggesting is appropriate for that role? Um, at the current time, um, I think it will depend on the individual that comes forward, but we, we do expect it to be around the 200,000 mark. Okay. Uh, have you any evidence at all that you would fail to recruit were you to offer a salary more commensurate, for example, uh, with industry? Because that is a high salary. What is the present salary scale for that post? We have taken advice um, on that from our recruitment agency. Um, and they are content that we need to be at that level to attract the individual that we require for the organisation in I, terms of leadership. I feared as much. Uh, I mean, uh, the interest in recruitment agencies, if I might be blunt, are to talk up salaries because their, uh, their percentage that they are paid is often dependent upon the salary of the post. Have you any evidence, knowing, knowing your organisation, and you have unfortunately had a principal who left, for whatever circumstances, knowing your organisation, have you any evidence that you require to offer a salary of that level in order to get a leader for the organisation that will lead you forward? Have you any evidence at all? I think the unique nature of SRUC means that it is a little bit different because of the different aspects of it. It's not one, it's an education research consultancy. So therefore the person that we're looking for is fairly unique and therefore evidence is very difficult to find. Uh, and that would be my honest answer well, to you. Well, that's an opinion, and you must admit, Mr. Macri, not evidence. And I, um, I do think it's, I think there is considerable scepticism. To be fair, and to be very straight about it, considerable scepticism that the level of salaries being paid is necessary within any higher education institution, uh, including your own, okay? Can I then come on to the Edinburgh merger, which does concern me? Because the principal said uh, in his letter on the 17th of November this, after careful consideration at court, it is clear that the level of control over future operations required by the SRUC board was only consistent with the continued operation of SRUC as a wholly autonomous institution. Now, from that, I understand that the 15 months, 15 months of discussion could not produce a structure which allowed SRUC to essentially integrate into one of the world's leading universities, which wanted 
to have a rural university structure, and you are familiar with the concept of rural universities in the rest of the world, and in Scotland it was viewed as, as very desirable to have one, surely that indicates that there was something wrong within those discussions and that there is something wrong in the way with the uh, SIUC is seeing itself if it cannot provide essentially the functions of a full, of a full rural university because of its structure and the views of its board. I think um, <clears throat> it would be unjust to assume that. Um, I think the board were very concerned about the stakeholders that we also represent and they, they, as, as has already been said by Janet, that we actually uh, laid out right at the beginning what we thought the structure should look like and there was compromises in there for the university to consider um, and they didn't want to take that forward. Uh, we didn't think they were particularly onerous, but it was more about us ensuring that, from an industry point of view, that it wasn't compromised in any way, shape or form going forward. And um, I think, uh, uh, as I say, that it was put on, on the table, if you will, um, right at day one, what we thought it should look like. Um, and we did speak about looking for a way forward, um, and we couldn't get that way forward. And I, I, I have to respect the university's views as they respected our views. Last point, but I just want you to comment on this analysis, right? And I'm a, I'm a supporter of SRUC, and you work closely with your previous chair and with your previous board. But it seems to me that you have a considerable problem. You were a standalone organization with these two parts, SRUC and the consulting arm. You absorbed three colleges. I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, you then had a period under a principle where there was a bit of vagueness, but you were looking for degree awarding powers. That was a key ambition, not just first ordinary degree awarding powers, but research degree awarding powers were being discussed. Then you decided that you would go into a merger with Edinburgh University and continue to pursue degree awarding powers, and you weren't pursuing them. Now, who knows? It seems to me that there is a vagueness about what your purpose is and a vagueness about the next step, which you may be looking to a new principal and chief executive to, dis to help you decide, but it is a matter of danger for you in two ways. One is there is a space in Scotland for a full rural university. You were discussing these matters with Chinese universities and others. Maybe another Scottish university will fill that function. Maybe the one that you're no longer merging with, that's a danger to you. The second area is it is not clear. You talk about assisting the industry. I think you do that. But it's not clear what your academic functions are. It's not clear what your functions are as an institution, an academic institution. And I do think we need some clarity on that. Then I'll respond. Thank you. The, we, we, we pursued the discussions with Edinburgh University because of our very strong, close working relationship with them. And we could not have gone into any more detail. We did, at the outset, were very clear about the need for governance that would ensure that there was the ability to sustain agriculture, land, rural activities within the university. This is against a background where the university had previously come out of agriculture. And this was one of the fundamental concerns, which was there from the outset. The fact that, that as we worked through those discussions and towards the end we could not crystallise that in an appropriate matter I think was a, a point of some significant concern for all of us. Are you then differing with Tim O'Shea's analysis? Because Tim O'Shea is quite clear. says that the level of control over future operations required by the SRUC board was only consistent with the continued operation of SRUC as a wholly autonomous institution. You appear to be saying that Edinburgh University uh, was in some sense not entirely serious about its commitment to the land-based industries. Is that what you're saying? Uh, w what I'm saying is we were seeking protection mechanisms for the future. Would you accept the analysis that even uh, your friends would look at, and I count myself as a friend of SRUC, would look at the organisation and say, you've lost your way and you need to find your way again pretty fast? Uh, no, I, I would say that we have, we have definitely regrouped after the, the decision by the university and we are very clear that we see ourselves as having a very strong future as an independent organisation. We're very clear that we have a role of national strategic importance to deliver upon, 
and uh, we have we have always said that the next step in the journey for Scotland's Rural College is to become Scotland's Rural University College and we are now actively looking to pursue whether we should seek our own degree awarding powers and that is something which we have actively discussed with the Scottish Funding Council and have also begun discussions with Scottish Government and it would be very helpful for us to know whether there is support for that because we are effectively at a fork in the road because if there is support for that and for there to be a dedicated uh, agricultural land-based rural university for Scotland which provides that appropriate focus and provides that sort of longevity and protection for the future where like-minded activities could be focused then we believe that there could be a very strong future developed for that. Um, and that is the stage that we are at. Now, if there is not support for that, if there is not support for us to pursue degree awarding powers, um, then that clearly has a fundamental bearing on our strategic future, because that does then mean that we do need to look at what other form of alliances do we need to have in place. I think there is one point that is extremely important, though, to be on record. Whilst we've enjoyed a very strong relationship with the University of Edinburgh, We've also enjoyed a very strong relationship with the University of Glasgow. If we look at our degree provision, it is only some 13% that is actually accredited by the University of Edinburgh. 87% is actually accredited by the University of Glasgow. And we previously had strong relationships with the University of Aberdeen, where there was accreditation. Now, these are all strong players in the areas that we actually have previously been strong players and some continue to have significant strengths in veterinary areas and other areas to do with the land. Um, but we are very clear that there is importance to ensure that there is a focus for these activities into the future. So we, I think we do have a strength in our vision. Glasgow School of Art, for example, has no degree awarding powers and has those awarded by Glasgow, and that's a stable situation. I, I'm, I have to admit, uh, Principal, I am still concerned, because what I'm hearing now is you might or might not want degree awarding powers, depends on whether other people support it, uh, rather than an argument within the institution. You might or might not have a partnership with Glasgow or Edinburgh or Aberdeen. I, I think more clarity is needed in this. Um, in terms of strategic direction. I'm not saying you need it today, but I am concerned by what I hear, Convener. Thank you for that. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Convener. May I just begin with a supplementary that came out of yep. Mr. Russell's questioning um, to, to, to begin with. Um, Mr. Russell mentioned the, the um, absorption of the three independent colleges some years ago um, as being the right thing to do. I, I was not quite as convinced at the time that it was the right thing to do. Um, but I wonder if you have any comment on what impact that absorption had on uh, your governance structures and whether some of the issues that we're exploring today could date back to, uh, could date back to that. The, the, the merger to form SIUC um, was um, I think particularly challenging. It brought together four institutions. The way in which we actually achieved it in governance terms was technically that the three colleges of Barony, Elmwood and Oakridge were merged into the legal entity of SAC, but we were very clear that we wanted to effectively um, launch this as a, a new institution, which is why we changed the name to S. SIUC, Scotland's Rural College, uh, the U being there with the long-term intention potentially of it becoming a university. So that was the, the intention at that stage. Um, the governance that we adopted, we adopted uh, governance on merger to recognise the importance of education and research at that stage with dedicated boards and that proved to be particularly relevant. But in terms of streamlining our governance and in terms of efficiencies that we've ref re been referred to earlier, we subsequently um, have changed that into an academic board. And I think it is important to say that um, during this period of merger, there has had to be a lot of focus on ration rationalising, changing 
and developing a, a, a new culture for the organisation and a set of shared values. And I think we, uh, well, it's perhaps better to look at what the Funding Council said. The Funding Council said that this had been a success, but they did recognise our ongoing estates and finance issues. Um, I think in terms of our governance now, we've been through a governance review at board level, which I think has been effective. And I think it is important to say that we have an academic board and we have just strengthened that academic board. And indeed, that academic board meets again tomorrow. And there is, I think, a, a, a vibrancy in the organisation now about actually developing the academic strategy for the future. And I would want to be clear that that we, are, um, we do have a clear focus on the fact that we would like to seek degree awarding powers because we do see that that provides a, 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 an assurance about our future and an ability to actually develop, develop our independence. One of the, th the points that actually hampers us at the moment is the fact that we are not able to play on a level playing field in, the, in terms of the international stage. And it is there that we would be seeking to tr increase our numbers in terms of international students. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that, and I think we're going to come on to one or two of the individual um, colleges later on and some of the impact on them. But ju you, you, you've mentioned several times um, that you have three key aims in the fields of education, research, and consultancy services. Can I ask how you prioritise those within the governance structure and, and how any priorities that are within the governance structure are reflected within that structure? We, it, within the governance structure, we, we give those functions equal weight. Um, I think it would be fair to say that as we worked through the merger, education matters uh, uh, dominated board business. Um, and as a result of that, one of the activities we undertook was to set up a dedicated board to look at specifically at consulting activities, which we have now um, really embedded into our governance structure in the form of the SAC Commercial Board, which looks predominantly at the consultancy activity, but also at the commercial research activity. But we give equal weight to the three functions. Okay, and just finally, convener, if I could, I, I, in, a, in a more general sense, um, I, I'm aware that there's, since 2012, I think it is, there's been a code of governance, um, which is being, I think, being reviewed at the moment. I think. Can I ask whether that code has impacted on you on in any way, um, and whether there are any significant changes you would wish to see in the review? Uh, yes, it has impacted on us in terms of the HE governance code, um, and we have, um, we are, are now. Uh, full, fully compliant. Um, one of the major changes we had to make was to bring uh, student and staff representation onto the, the main board, which we have done and which we have found to be very effective, and we have welcomed that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, you mentioned the education was sort of uh, your prime um, function in, in some respects, or, or what's the effect? But in June 2015, the vice principal for education retired and the vacancy has not been filled, so just wondering why that was and how, how that's been managed, governed. True, uh, David McKenzie retired, and we took the decision um, that it would be appropriate. We have two assistant principals within the education division, one who looks after higher education, one who looks after further education, and both of those uh, assistant principals are currently acting up and together with myself running the division. We are actively looking at how we take forward our academic affairs within the institution. And uh, one of the things that we as an executive management team has been looking to do is strengthen our cross-divisional working. And in particular, how do we strengthen the cross-divisional working between education and research? OK, thanks. thanks. But um, you know, the, the vice principal for education is a post that hasn't existed for a good number of months. Um, you are still recruiting uh, at the moment for a new principal and chief executive. The start, is that one of the reasons why there isn't such a hefty uh, bill for the top people uh, in this last year? Has that reduced your costs, in fact, by the delay in the um, appointment of these particular posts? No, I, I don't. Because it was suggested that we save money on salaries, you know. 
uh, from one year, was it, Mr. Macri? You said it had gone down from 900 to about 750,000. Is that part of the reason? The, the, well, it, effectively, we have um, we have some restructuring within the executive management team, um, and I mean, I, 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 it is, and we would be looking to keep that as lean as possible into the future. Okay, um, and in terms of uh, the appointments we're talking about, you know, education is pretty central to uh, your aims, as you've uh, explained to us, and the government's arrangements and so on. Um, in terms of the appointment of uh, someone to do that job, uh, and or the principal and chief executive, how are you thinking about this in terms of uh, the academic background that successful candidates might have in order to be able to take forward this very key uh, area of your operation? Well, I in, in terms of the, we clearly need a, a, a rounded set of skills for the management of the organisation. And it, it is absolutely pivotal that there is appropriate academic leadership. Um, clearly, on, on our executive management team, um, Jeff is our, our, our leads on academic matters. Um, but in terms of the skill set for the um, principal stroke chief executive, um, then that would be a matter I'd need to hand over to Pat. <coughs> but I think it is important to, to put on record if, if part of the questioning here is, I've made it very clear I am not a candidate for that role. You know, alluding to that, but obviously a senior academic on the executive team is quite important when education is so central. I don't know whether Jeff's experience is in uh, research or whatever, but the actual business of getting people in through the doors at the basic level uh, is the only way you're going to have a college that actually becomes a university. Um, do you want to comment on that? Yes, very happy to. I, I think, yes, I do have experience in, in education, particularly postgrad education, but my primary um, experience is in research. I think it is absolutely central that we, we, we have experience that spans each of those functions. And as Janet has said, that's what we're seeking to achieve, both in, in the new appointment, but, but in the wider executive team. As she's also referred to, I think that our current structure um, has had many advantages, but has, has possibly weakened some of the linkages across divisions. We, we feel that we've got a, a really strong contribution to make to tackling some really important local and global challenges around food security, environmental security, resource use efficiency. And the USP we have is the combination of consulting, research and education skills. And, and what we see as a clear uh, aim of our future strategy is to, is to maximise the benefit of having those functions in the single organisation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so yes, Mr. Convener, uh, that um, in relation to the FE and, and, and HE uh, piece, and as Janet's already mentioned, we've got two very capable people uh, there at the moment, and we're, we've currently got that um, going, being managed by Janet and them um, very successfully at this point in time. Um, but in relation to the uh, Chief Executive Principal, uh, before we actually went uh, out into the public domain, we took views from all the staff and they were all engaged in the process as to what the job specification should look like. And we have into that job specification a clear academic um, need, uh, if you will. So I think we, we fully recognise that that's extremely important going forward. Uh, helpful just now. Uh, Graeme Day. Thank you. J just for the purposes of clarity, could you tell me how many members there are of the executive team in total and how many would have an expertise on education, research and consultancy? There are four of us. Four in total, OK. The four of us that are here. Yeah. OK. Um, right, well, let's look at some more about the assets and so on. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you um, I understand that the uh, our, our, sorry, SRUC is, is currently selling or has possibly sold a number of assets, including Elmwood Farm, Fife, Kels of A, uh, the, and Fish Farm in Dumfriesshire, the Westwoods, Aberdeenshire, and Bog Hall Farm and Farmhouse in Midlothian. And um, the Scottish Parliament Information Service understands that the closing dates were... Um, the end of October 2015. Um, 
I, I, I would like to clarify uh, with yourselves, whoever chooses to answer this, um, how were these assets selected for sale? And could you provide an update? And is the sale crucial to the financial stability of the organisation? And will it have an impact on higher and further education provision? Okay, thank, thank you for the question. Um, them if, but that I that, to that might be helpful. Around, yes. um, <laughs> In, in terms of our assets, um, when, when we were SAC, we recognised that we had uh, excess assets. And when, after the merger, bringing together the organisation, it became very clear that we have over, over twice what we actually need um, and a number of excess assets. We did some uh, very detailed work on this uh, throughout a lot of 2014. Uh, which resulted in us putting together an infrastructure strategy which looked at those assets which were surplus to requirements um, and which had no direct impact on any of our operational functions. Uh, those were identified, they were taken forward to the board and they were approved for disposal. Um, I think it would be fair to say that none of, none of those which we have disposed of yet um, had have required us in any way to displace activity. Um, in terms of the, um, the sales, uh, we have had a number of sales that have concluded in recent weeks. Um, some of those have finalised, but a number are still with lawyers for finalisation um, about uh, various different aspects, depending on the offers that have been made and so on. Um, for us, which ones have reached completion, please? Um, I'd need to turn to Alistair for detail. Um, the, all, all of the, the properties that you mentioned there, that we're currently in discussions with the, the preferred bidders and going through the, the legal process on, on that front. Right, and, and could you clarify if there are more in the pipeline then, please? I'm, I'm able to confirm there are, oh, and there Thank will you. be more asset sales, yes. Can you clarify for us what those are today, or could you put that in writing for the committee, please? We, we can confirm them, yes. Today, or in writing? Uh, I can't. I, I think it would probably be easier if yeah. I confirm them in writing. Right, thank you. Um, and, and then, if, if you'd like to proceed to, um, could you, or one of your colleagues, explain what impact, if it will have an impact, this would have on the delivery of higher and further education? You've said that they don't affect... Uh, anything, but can I seek reassurance on that? Yeah, absolutely, they will. That those assets which have been sold to date will have no direct impact on delivery. Right, and then um, lastly, um, there have been concerns which um, uh, you, you will no doubt be aware of um, raised in the Scottish Parliament um, on the 7th of October, and I can go into that detail if necessary, but if you're aware of that um, <coughs> discussion with the, uh, the questioning of the Cabinet Secretary on the Barony College, then I'll, I'll just leave... Um, leave that um, as, as a question. Um, is the Barony campus um, going to remain a key part of uh, future plans and how, will the per how do you propose to ensure that FE provision continues on this site? What will remain a key part of our plans is to ensure that we have delivery in the west of Scotland and uh, in particular in terms of the southwest we recognise the importance of uh, FE and skills delivery in Dumfries. We have been actively working with colleagues in uh, Dumfries about uh, the options with regard to how we take things forward. We have very successful uh, research activity at the Crichton Royal Farm on the, the adjacent to the Crichton campus and we have um, a successful consultancy office also based there. Um, wherever possible, we are trying to co-locate our activities because we see the benefits, particularly for students, in, in order to be able to experience sort of research and consultancy activities. And um, in working through, we have also learned that it is important, wherever possible, to co-locate with other educational partners. So I'm pleased to say that we enjoy um, a good working relationship with Dumfries and Galloway College and that we are in active discussion with them about how we could further collaborate. Um, we have um, identified that a, po a possible preferred option is to relocate to the Crichton campus, 
but we do need to, uh, we're in the process of reviewing that effectively in terms of our student numbers and our student activities that we perform. I think it's important to make reference to the National Land-Based Strategy on Education and Training, which was published in August, which looked at uh, a significant number of different <coughs> areas and involved feedback from employers. And we're now um, reviewing our infrastructure strategy in light of that document as to what we take forward. So I can give an assurance that we are certainly looking to confirm there will be activity in the West. Um, we are actively expecting that to be in Dumfries um, and we're working uh, really through the options that the Crichton campus would present. Thank you. You haven't specifically answered my question, although you've given me a, a lot of helpful detail. Uh, can you answer the question about re seeking reassurance on the Barony um, campus? Well, I'm, I'm giving reassurance that there will be activity in the southwest, uh, in Dumfries, uh, probably at Crichton. Um, in terms of whether we continue at the Barony campus, um, that that is not currently our preferred option. Thank you. Sorry, I was waiting for the microphone. It's probably been. Uh, given quite a lot, lot of detail. I mean, I'm quite well aware of Barney. My two sons went to Barney, so I should, I should maybe state that as well. But that's quite a bit in the, in the past. I think my father also went there too, uh, or whatever its predecessor was in those days. Um, Barney campus has a, quite a large farm, obviously, and, and the Crichton Institute has very much concentrated on dairy, but there's, there's agricultural engineering, there's forestry, all sorts of quite important things to, uh, happening at Barney. So, um, yeah, I'm... I think I'm concerned, like my fellow South of Scotland MSP, regarding the Barony campus because uh, we're well aware uh, uh, of its importance to that area. So just um, wondering in, in your deliberations uh, whether you have actually made a decision <coughs> yet regarding staying, uh, keeping the Barony Pharma and all its activities and, and if there was a move to Crichton, could all of those activities be moved forward? Because I can't see how that could happen personally. We, we haven't made final decisions. We are in the process of working through what are our options. Um, I think it is worth saying we are obviously, like others, working in an environment where we're not entirely clear what our future funding will be. Um, we need to be very clear that what we plan to do, we can afford to continue to do into the future. Um, I think specifically with regard to the barony, it's worth saying that the condition of the buildings um, and the condition survey which was undertaken post-merger would suggest that uh, it, it, the monies that would need to be reinvested are certainly not monies that we have available. Um, we have discussed this actively with the Funding Council and we have been encouraged to explore the Crichton campus option. Yeah. Um, thank you, and I, I, this is a slightly parochial aspect to this um, question because I represent the western half of Dumfries and Galloway, in which forestry is of immense importance, uh, and the Crichton, uh, sorry, the Barony plays a very important role in uh, forestry education, particularly from a practical perspective. Um, uh, can you, uh, I have, I'm open-minded, absolutely, on restructuring, and I can understand the possible need to do so, um, but uh, can you give me an assurance, is it possible to give an assurance, that the current courses that are available through the barony, uh, particularly in forestry, will not be diminished by any structural changes that you make? What I, what I would say is I would refer back again to the national strategy on uh, land-based strategy on education and training, because that provides some pointers in terms of what we need to do. Um, with regard to uh, forestry, we recognise the significant importance of forestry to uh, the, the area and indeed um, we also recognise the, the unit within Inverness College in terms of the National Forestry Centre. I'm pleased to say we've had a collaborative dialogue and I think we would envisage that there is a, a role for both institutions to continue, to continue with forestry given the geographical distance. Um, and I think something, though, that we would like to do is improve our links with the Forestry Commission in the area so that we can ensure that we are actually um, 
well, as joined up as possible um, and, and delivering the kind of practical training that we recognise is necessary. Well, thank you. It's not quite the categorical assurance I was looking for, but I will monitor this as it goes forward quite carefully because it, I cannot overstate the importance of practical forestry training in the southwest of Scotland. Thank you. Mike. I think that sort of typifies the problem I have, and I just want to reiterate that problem. Nobody d doubts that you have considerable financial pressures upon you. Nobody doubts that you've inherited an estate which is by no means ideal. You, know, you have buildings here and buildings there, and it's difficult. But this is the same problem as I believe the committee experienced, I certainly experienced, when we had the first discussion with, with your, 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 your staff about the veterinary service, which is it was really difficult to know what you intended to do. And, and this, is, this, I do believe, comes back to a lack of a strategic vision or plan. If you have decided and want to dispense with the Barony College, which may well be uh, very regrettable, but may well be necessary within the plan, it would be best to say, yes, that's what we've decided to do, and to take the consequences of the political row that will then take place, and at the end of the day, to do it or not to do it. And it, similarly, if you've decided not to deliver forestry, you know, I, I think that would be wrong in terms of the needs of forestry. I actually think you need to improve your forestry delivery and increase it, because I'm, you know, I'm hearing from people who want different forestry training. But it's clarity. It's clarity on what you intend to do and when you intend to do it. And I do believe, with the greatest respect, that the, the problem that you have is that you don't know this because you don't have clarity and strategic plan. You've either got one partner or another partner, and you're not sure whom. You're either delivering you know, uh, training or you're delivering high-level uh, education, and you don't know which or whether you should do both. It's an observation, but I, I do think you've just illustrated today that uncertainty, which over a period of time needs to be resolved f to have a secure future. Um, could, I, could I maybe say that I take on board that comments and um, having effectively been about six weeks in the chair, um, uh, you can imagine that currently my, my view is that we need to absolutely get that clarity established very quickly. Uh, I'm very content, um, despite us looking for a new chief executive principal, that in Janet we have a very able individual who will shape this. We, we've just come through a period um, where, if, if you will, we, we, we part up because we were letting the alignment process come to a conclusion, and that came to a conclusion in, 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 in June. Uh, since then, we've now changed, if you will, the chair and the board. Uh, we have new members on our board, and one of the things that we're very clear about is that we need to get that vision clearly established for everyone concerned, including our staff. Uh, um, and, and that's something we're working very hard on at this moment in time. And we do have some strands, if you will, of what that should look like. And certainly, to what degree, a war and power is a core part of that. So I think it's fair to say that we are working on that extremely hard. Um, um, uh, I, I think it would be foolhardy for me as a chair to say within six weeks, here is the plan, uh, and, and I'd rather give it time, and, and I would like to think that you might give me time to actually uh, make that happen. Uh, and, and, I, and I would suggest to you that um, I'd like to think we would give you that clarity very soon. I think that's convenient, extremely helpful, but I, I'm glad, you know, very grateful that, that, that Mr Macri recognises that this is a core problem. And you can't, with the greatest respect, be parked up for long. The, the tyres are losing air. The people are going past you. You need to get out of that lay-by as quickly as possible. But you also need to go where you're doing, go, know where you're going. Yeah. You can't just wander out the lay-by and see what's next. No, I, I think You'll get run down. I think it's fair to say, uh, if I can give the, the committee any kind of um, sense of, you know, that, that the board are very clear about that. Uh, I, I convened my first board meeting in October. Um, I made it very clear at that first board meeting exactly what you've just said. I think that's fair to say mm -hmm. that we had to get clarity, we had to get our vision, and we had to be very you know, direct about it. And I did actually say at that point in time that we are going to have to face up to tough decisions that won't always be popular. And I realise that. But that doesn't mean they're wrong decisions. Uh, it means that we, we need to get that. So, so um, as I say, if you can, if you can bear with, with us, um, I think that clarity will come through very soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. You know, um, in terms of clarity and vision, sometimes things out with your control happen that create a problem for you. I want to address the Elmwood <laughs> College. Uh, my understanding is Fife College have indicated they intend to vacate the Elmwood campus in August of 2016. Yeah. 
So I really want to seek reassurance uh, from you as to the impact on and the commitment to ongoing SRUC delivered courses in that location. I ask that as a constituency MSP for Angus South, from where some of your students are drawn. So, you know, that we have to recognise here that simply because somewhere a college is located in a particular place, it doesn't draw from a, a much wider area and therefore impact on that area. So I'd just like to explore that subject with you. That. I mean, obviously when we merged um, and Elmwood College became part of SIUC, for the first year the totality of Elmwood College was within SIUC. Then we demerged uh, about uh, 40, 45, 50 percent of it back to Fife College. Um, and I think, you know, the, throughout that process we'd envisaged that we would have a collaborative arrangement, be co-located. Um, the decision, and we now have a final decision from Fife College that they do intend to come out next summer, clearly has a substantial bearing on, on what we do, because it is a significant size site, um, and we, that, that is a fundamental um, now change that we have to, to work through, what are the implications. Um, there are obviously also... Um, implications in terms of the national land-based strategy, which we're beginning to see come through. Um, and we, we have had some dialogue with the principal of Fife College, um, and we are in active dialogue with Fife Council, really about what, what might be the options in terms of how this is taken forward. Um, indeed, whether this means that some of the provision that, that, that is undertaken by ourselves should be undertaken by, by others, um, just in terms of whether that makes more sense from a management perspective. But this is early days. We've only received this decision within uh, the last few, few weeks, um, and, we need to, and we are very actively working through what does this actually mean. Uh, can I just explore that for like, when you talk there about delivery by others, do you mean in other locations or on that campus? Don't know. I mean, I appreciate the difficulties when this has just arisen, but that, that will not offer much in the way of no, reassurance to your but, staff or students. But, but, but um, we, we, we have had a situation at the Elmwood camp campus where we have not been able to achieve the student number targets this year. They've been running at approximately 70% for both FE and HE. So this is another factor in, in terms of that we need to try and understand why has that arisen, what are the implications, um, and in, in terms of the overall picture, um, what, what is appropriate for SIUC in terms of future delivery? So if I may convene, I, I take your point about um, the numbers of students, but there are some courses that are fully subscribed, and I think there's one oversubscribed. Is there not scope taking up, I think it was Mr Russell's point about expansion of forestry uh, delivery, is there not an argument for having, running forestry courses, for example, at Elmwood, um, we have forests in the east as well as the west. Um, it's certainly something that, that hasn't r arisen at all before, but it's certainly something that I would be happy that we looked at. I think one of the things, though, that is pertinent and we find increasingly is about ensuring that we have a critical mass of students, an appropriate number of students together, mm -hmm. to have that kind of student body, to give them the kind of student experience that they're actually looking for. And again, that is one of the challenges that we actually face, to be able to actually bring together appropriate cohorts, um, not only from the point of view of what would be the benchmark norm um, and, and what would be appropriate from an efficiency perspective, but also from the student experience angle. Can you just finish? I accept that point, but is this not perhaps indicative of a failure of marketing the cause and what it offers? Because it seems bizarre that you are located close to the home of golf, for example. You're only a few miles from the Angus Glens, which is a centre of gamekeeping. If you're struggling to attract numbers, does that not tell you perhaps you need to be more active in marketing what the college offers? Well, I, I can absolutely assure you, because it's something I've looked into, and it was something we were very conscious of, that there was a, a mixture of identities with, within Cooper. Um, we put more resource into marketing this year than we have done before, and a disproportionate amount went in there. So I do not believe that this is as a result of marketing problems. All right, well, thank you for that information.
Okay. Um, uh, I think it's a final question from Sarah Boyer. Thank you very much, Convener. It's obviously been quite a difficult period financially with quite a lot of uncertainty ahead. Um, can I ask about the failure of the strategic alignment with Edinburgh University? Has that pre presented a particular funding shortfall for SRUC? Um, and if so, how do you propose to mitigate it? Um, no, I wouldn't say it presents a, a funding shortfall. Um, I think the alignment uh, gave rise to potential opportunities, particularly around um, potential capital developments with the university. Um, but in terms of our operational position, um, the kind of margins that the university was asking us to project uh, were extremely significant. Um, we, ha are, we have done and continue to do our own planning <coughs> But I think, like many, we're awaiting the results today to some extent of the comprehensive spending review. What, what is that going to give rise to? And what are then the resultant uh, implications in, in Scotland? So we are at the moment scenario planning. Um, and I, 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 we, we returned last year a small deficit. Um, it was uh, around about 1.5% on turnover. But I have to say that's consistent with, for example, at least one of the ancients that I looked at. So, um, and we are working very hard this year to try and achieve um, a, a similar position. Um, so it is, it is not easy by any means, but I believe that the measures that we're taking, some of the restructuring that we're aware that we continue to need to do, um, should put us in a position where we have a... Uh, viable institution into the future. Can you translate what you meant by um, the university margins being too tough? What does that mean in practice? Um, in terms of when we were working through with the university, in terms of the, some of the financial planning, um, some of the some of the margins that we were being asked to model were in the order of five and seven percent. Okay, thank you. As they say, never say never. Uh, a final, final question. Oh. Final, final, final. Uh, right, Angus MacDonald first. Okay, uh, if, if I could uh, perhaps turn to um, oversight by Oscar uh, in overseeing the, the governance arrangements. Um, you'll be aware that the recent reports by Audit Scotland have highlighted the need for robust and transparent uh, governance arrangements. Now, I'm curious as to whether um, SRUC's governance arrangements fit in with Oscar rules. And have any recent discussions been held between the SIUC and, and Oscar uh, about the governance structures at the college? Uh, we, we, I'm, I'm able to confirm categorically that our governance is absolutely compliant with Oscar rules. Uh, we, we are a charity and um, we take those responsibilities very seriously. And I can assure you that on an annual basis, uh, the board are reminded of their responsibilities as uh, not only directors but also as trustees. <coughs> okay, I understand that there's no uh, published report accompanying the accounts of any uh, external assessment or audit of such compliance. The, um, the, the, the statement within the accounts by the independent auditors, Ernst & Young, would, would be, I believe, sufficient to give that reassurance. Okay, thanks. Ferguson. Thank you, Convener. Just it, it, it's a very brief one, going back to forestry, I'm afraid. But uh, I think I'm right in saying that the only forestry degree available in Scotland at the moment is at Aberdeen University, and that Aberdeen University is looking to end that course and embed it in embed forestry in another part of their curriculum. Um, given the importance, uh, the strategic importance of the forestry sector in Scotland, um, I wonder if I can ask if you do get degree granting status, whether a degree in forestry is something you might look at taking forward. Absolutely. I think that this is exactly the, the type of activity where we see that we could have a very real role to play for Scotland in terms of being able to provide these for these specialist areas. Um, you mentioned forestry. I think one of the other areas we're also conscious of is around veterinary nursing. And we're pleased to be working with Edinburgh College in terms of the transfer of the veterinary nursing and also with North East Scotland um, about veterinary, uh, veterinary and animal care transfers. 
Um, so what we would want to look to is areas of growth. I know we've talked today about a lot of our challenges, which um, are ones which are perhaps around restructuring and so on and, 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 and selling of assets. But what we, what we really are wanting to do is get ourselves into a position so that we are strong as an institution to really build on our specialist nature and develop into those new areas where, where we are not served in Scotland with those particular qualifications. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, obviously, we've been talking about issues of vital concern to the health of uh, rural Scotland today, and uh, I wouldn't want to diminish uh, the fact that uh, everyone you know, is concerned about the kind of spending there can be uh, from public sources to ensure that rural Scotland is healthy. Um, uh, we also understand that uh, Scottish Rural College development is in a state of flux, and you've uh, elucidated some of the facts about that just now. And we will reflect on your evidence and we'll be communicating with you in due course. I'd like to thank uh, um, Pat Macri, Janet Swaddling, the team, uh, for coming just now. And uh, we will uh, have to move on at this stage because at the next meeting of the committee, which is tomorrow at 9 o'clock, we will be considering a draft of the Stage 1 report on the land reform of Scotland Bill in private. As previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session to consider evidence heard this morning. I now close the public part of the meeting and ask the public gallery to be cleared. We'll take a short break.